Okay. I'll put this away. We are rolling. Let's start it out right now and give a blues alley welcome to Eva Cassidy. For those of you that weren't here before, uh, yeah. <laughs> on piano, Lenny Williams. Yeah. On bass, Chris Piondo. I'm going to grab the mic away from you, but because I just have to say that uh, I'd like you all to join me in giving a warm round of applause to our star, Eva Cassidy. Yeah. It was a terrible night for a gig. It was like it was an off night of an off night. It was two days after New Year's, right? How horrible is that? Two days after everybody in the world just got drunk and spent all their money going out, we have to do the gig. We weren't household names, even, even in the local scene. They didn't think it much of Eva. It's insanity, really, when you think about it. Chain, chain, chain. Chain, chain, chain. Blues Alley was an SOS up in the air to, you know, say, hey, Eva's here, she's making music, this is something to listen to. And this record was going to be the thing that was going to be the fastest way to get something out because the way Eva and I recorded was just like a snail's pace. And so we play the songs we've been playing, we record them, and we put out a little record. Maybe get some airplay, sell a thousand copies. She gets to put some money towards a PA system and her name's out there. We had a friend who played trombone in the Eva Cassidy Chuck Brown band who did remote recording. And um, we entered into an agreement with him to, to bring his truck out with his equipment. And the, it was an ADAT machine at the time. You link three machines together and you get 24 tracks of eight tracks. Then you take them and you mix them later. We bought a box of tapes, I think it was 160 bucks, which was a lot of money for us back then. You told me to leave you alone. My papa said, come on. My doctor said, take it easy. Oh, but your loving is much too strong. I'm at it to your chain, chain, chain. We were definitely on high alert because everybody knew that Eva had spent like whatever little money she had and Chris had spent whatever little money they had together to, to have this recorded. You know, it was a big deal and so she had time nobody had any money. Well, of course, mom and dad were there, and several of her very dear, close friends, and uh, a lot of musicians um, were there. And, uh, of course, there was some press there. Uh, some f a review from the Washington Post was there. I forget, I think the alley seat's about um, 180, I think. And uh, I would hazard a guess that we probably had half the room with, with people that we had some kind of personal tie to. Um, but the first show, the first night, we had a full house. It was, it was jammed. I think she's pretty nervous going out there. I remember standing with her. I remember she was nervous. I would say the same thing to her all the time. 
they want to love you. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. They show up. They just want to love you. You just have to let them. She was fine when she was singing. She was fine when she was doing the music. The myth of Eva, the, the, the shy, retiring, I'm too scared to bark at a mouse. Um, no, Eva was an introvert. Eva could walk on stage and be terribly different and almost nervous about saying good evening or, or hello or welcome to the club. And the minute she opened her mouth and sang the first note, it was an instantaneous transition to, I've got this and now I own this and I own the room. Some old hotel room in Memphis. I see the city through. I'm just chasing me my time. Eva didn't have a realistic sense of her own gifts. I always got the impression that, that she thought we were the people that really had it together and that she was just doing the best she could. You know, which, you know, knowing what we know, that, that's, uh, that's pretty funny. So the nightmare. Wow, she nailed that, didn't she? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whoa. That's the outstanding yeah. quality of her voice that I just love. Grab one note and just stay right, yeah. right there. <laughs> you know? Never goes sharp, never goes flat. No. And you never have to worry. I mean, as a, you don't have to worry about it as a performer. She fly alone. She was just too good to, to, to be ignored. I played with you know, show bands with very flamboyant singers, but who were good sellers of themselves or songs. I mean, to my knowledge, she never practiced. She never, she didn't warm up. Then she'd set up in the first set and just open up and wham, there it was. I mean, just this effortless, pitch perfect, wonderful stuff. You know, it was quite astounding that way. Any pleasure can be found. She had had maybe at the most a half a dozen, but at least three or four sits with major record companies. Columbia Records. Uh, and Sony, right? Yeah, yeah, they, they became Sony. Yeah. Uh, EMI Apollo. Yeah. Um, uh, Blue Note. Blue Note. Yeah, and, and nothing ever happened. The major problem with Eva was that most of the time when people, I would imagine, are face to face with a record company executive, they're just so happy to be there. They're going to say whatever they have to say to get through the door. They're going to, they're going to be perky and bubbly and positive, and and they're going to try to seal the deal. Eva was nice but she wasn't that person she was a person who had to go hiking or do something in a little bit and she was going to meet the person and roll out as fast as she could she was the most stubborn person musically stubborn in a good way she was not going to be swayed by any anybody's opinion you know i mean here she is a young singer in dc meeting with record companies. They're basically telling her, we can sell you if you just do R&B or if you just do country music. Basically dangling that carrot in front of her. She's like, I can't do that. But I think that's also probably what made Eva great. That she just said, I only want to do stuff that I connect with. I only want to do stuff that I feel. I don't want to fake it. I don't want to go out there and be a somebody's show pony. Well, yeah. But so it's then, insane then, not to know. I mean, it's, yeah. the, it's like I'm, I'm sitting yeah. across from these people who sign major acts, and I'm thinking they should, you know, be putting something together in the back, pulling some papers out. Right. You know, <laughs> sign quickly. Money should change hands. Something should happen. And they basically even never got a chance to see any of this yeah. because people were not smart enough to see what she was all about. She's gone. 
first met Chris and dealing with the Eva stuff, I thought, wow, this guy's really inflexible, man. He says, this is what we're gonna do. This is, this is how it's gonna be. And then over time, everything he said was right. And he was just like, best singer ever. And I was like, everybody's kind of like, yeah, man. Yeah, best singer ever. But he was right, you know? <laughs> it was like, wow. For her memory now, she's gone. I just accepted the fact that I said, look, you're working with somebody who's really good. And uh, is a, it, that has to be enough for you because she doesn't care about being uh, successful and isn't willing to compromise in any way, shape, or form in order to become successful. I don't think she ever thought, you know, I want to be signing autographs and coming out the door and people mobbing me and having my own dressing room and going on David Letterman. That, those are things that she wouldn't have liked at all. Our entertainment will continue with the second show. Eve will be back tomorrow night for two more shows. Musically, the first night was a great night, as far as everyone was concerned. We get through the whole thing and we think, okay, we got through it. We, everybody sounded good, everybody played pretty well. And, uh, and then we come in the next night, you know, because no sound check the next night, we're just showing up like an hour before or something like that. And Chris is like, oh, we can't use the tape from last night because there's buzz in it. There was a conflict between some of the voltages of the recording setup and I guess the lighting on stage. And there was this hum that was impossible to ignore. You know, we were trying to get some help. The club, you know, the, the sound person didn't seem to be too interested. It's like, you know, you guys, I don't know you guys. You're, who are you? And I'm trying to eat here. And so it sucked. It was all, you know, just garbage. Because the second night was just supposed to be the gravy, right? You get it right the first night, and then you can relax and let go, and if something transcendent happens the second night, that's just icing on the cake, because we got the meat right there. So now it's back to the drawing board. You know, so you have one night, you can't screw up. Nobody wants to be the one to make that mistake. You're a really good audience. Thank you so much for coming here tonight. Chris and Eva were the core of the thing, and the rest of us were, were, were hired on. There was a decision to be made, and it's a musical decision, or whether it's a, a, a logistical decision or a gig decision. Uh, obviously, if Eva had a strong opinion about it, we would obviously listen to her, but she would very often defer to Chris. He played a sort of a straw boss role. If anyone played a kind of musical director role, it was Keith. Keith helped Eva a lot with her, with her guitar parts. If there was something that um, she was stuck on, he was right there. He was a guitar teacher. Lenny understood lots of the, the jazz standards that Eva wanted to try, and he could just play them right away. And Race played very soft, which is unusual for a drummer. When you're trying to keep up with a drummer uh, who's playing loud, that really makes it hard. To, to think and to get things done. And so that was a good combination of people. Oh, this is, uh, I like this groove. I remember this. Yeah. So the ones that are on the record, we don't remember that well. <laughs> She was just an extraordinary, natural, effortless talent. It, it, that, that streak in her of music, not just music, but her visual arts too, but, but that streak in her of just raw, basic, talented musicianship was huge. You know, she's 
I want a pretty decent guitar part on that, don't you think? I should play good on everything, yeah. really. How much practicing on the guitar did she do? When we first put the band together, she couldn't play, really. I mean, she could play a little bit. Um, yeah. So she just learned the yeah. yeah. She didn't want to play guitar yeah. in the band. Remember when we yeah. had to lean on her to get her to play guitar? The band that we took out and played a lot of live gigs with was pretty small. I said, we need you to do this for the band. And she said, oh, all right. Yeah. The ability on guitar went from rudimentary to second nature over a six year period. Eva was, uh, you know, uh, an artist. I think she was always listening and looking to develop. She'd had some bands before, but I think being in, in the same band for a lengthy period of time was was helpful in evolving what she was doing. And uh, I think just the fact that we had confidence in her ability to play and do it you know, uh, helped her to realize that she could. I never played in a, a band for any period of time where there was absolutely zero in the way of ego issues. This never, ever, ever arose. That was the biggest thing that I think made that band work because there was a sense of somebody had something to say, they'd get heard, and there was a lot of good feedback and a lot of good um, uh, tips. She hated that guitar, though, because it, it had a tremolo bar on it, and it would go out of tune. Oh, right. And she took it personally, and, uh... Yeah, her patience with tuning oof. discrepancies was but slight. <laughs> and that guitar was, was famous for going out of tune. Well, there were some things we did that night that we didn't really do very often, and that there there was a high, you know, possibility that they'd crash and burn. So, the more songs that we felt good about that were things that we could do in our sleep, the the, the more stabilized the set would be. And we didn't have any great person that had a divine plan to tell us what to do. We were just trying to not mess up, and uh, we were, we were scared about the amount of money that was hanging out there that uh, would evaporate and be worthless if, if the whole thing was a wash. So just trying to get through it, that's all. Ask her right before the show started, what key do you do Autumn Leaves in? And Autumn Leaves is like, again, such a standard standard that I know it in pretty much all the standard keys, you know, G, C, D, and she says, I think I start on E flat minor. And I'm like, okay, no problem, because I didn't want to be the guy that was like, you kidding me, E flat minor? Autumn Leaves uh, is what has always been one of my favorite recordings uh, of hers. Uh, you know, just the creation of mood that takes place. The fall And the way she's singing in a real horn-like sort of way, you can all, you almost picture as a, uh, her, it's the voice as a musical instrument, and uh, and you, and she holds a lot of long notes, and you really hear the beauty of her tone. And the subject matter of the song it has so much to do with the natural elements, which was such a big thing in her life. You know, she didn't just have a job at a tree nursery because that was the only job she could get. She really liked being outdoors and nature was a source of uh, 
inspiration to her in a big way. So that was a song that lyrically encompassed a lot of things that she could get her teeth into, and it's just a beautiful performance. Since you went away The days grow long And soon I hear When people hear Eva, there's no phony, I want to impress you type of approach to singing. And, and, and most people, I think, can, can smell that a mile away. What it does is it makes the singing honest. And that's why she finally was understood by a lot of people. When autumn leaves start to fall. Eve is playing guitar and you hear that quite well. And then in the middle of the thing, there's a piano solo and another color enters the picture. It's always tricky, and I'm sure Keith, you had this. I mean, it's like, it's, here's the moment you come in and you're like, am I painting a mustache on the Mona Lisa at this point? You know, it's like she's in this perfect world, and all you're trying to do is not screw it up, you know? Yeah. I mean, if you're a professional jazz musician, you should be able to play any standard standard, something that simple in any key. But if you're going up for Blues Alley and you're doing a record that night, you'd like a chance to just make sure, you know, you can put your fingers on all the right keys because it's, it's, the difference is, you know, here's a standard key, you know, a lot of white keys, stuff you're used to playing, and she's, I'm thinking, what is it? No, that's not it, it's not that, you know, so it's like, it's very confusing because you're trying to transpose in your head. You know, so what I did, she's playing down here, on the guitar, on this thing. So I thought, well, I'll just step here and tinkle, you know, just do some little quiet things. And then I started playing, you know. But anyway, I got through it without any major, Blunders, but I was kind of sweating bullets on that. Since you went away, the days grow long, and soon I hear old winter songs. Did you notice after the solo, I just stopped playing, right? Because I wasn't going to stay in for the ending. Because I was like, I have no idea what she does at the end, so. <laughs> well, that was, that was effective. Uh, although, you know, it was. <laughs> yes, uh, a decision uh, born out of fear, but effective. <laughs> <laughs> when That's a tune that everybody's played for, you yeah. know, decades. Right. And have all done it virtually the same way, either, you know, kind of a jazz ballad or a swing tune, right. mostly a swing tune. Yeah. And the first time I heard her do that, I was like, how did you think, how did you come up, you know, like, so it was just like, and it seems so simple and obvious after you hear her do it, that that's the yeah. way that song yeah. should always be done. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then she, that's the, uh, the genius of Eva. I miss you. She knew the song, she knew how to play it, and she just had an automatic pilot and she could feel it. I don't think it can be taught. I don't think it's anything she even understood. She does. Yeah, she that probably uh, felt good. They call it Stormy Monday. We did do music that wasn't necessarily always her favorite stuff because we needed enough music so we could play four sets 
and um, there wasn't enough music at the time to really do more than one or two sets, so we had to throw in some music that like Keith had or I had. But Tuesday's just as bad. So that song was definitely one of the better connect with the audience songs that we did. And Thursday is also sad. We were ballad heavy. You know, the places we were playing at, I think they were used to a little bit more up-tempo, dance-oriented things. Well, Chris would have this gentle sort of semi, not an argument, but this gentle sort of nudging discussion would go on between them about writing up song lists for do bars, and she would have, you know, eight ballads in the first set, and Chris was playing. We can't do that. We do have to play some up-tempo tunes. And this would, a uh, little push up, push up, would go one, and she'd harump a little bit sometimes. Mm, that's when I get down on my knees. When we were setting up the first day of these records, uh, she was sitting right here writing out song lists, and I had finished with, with drums, and I sat down there next to her, and she said, you want to make, make some changes? And she, I remember we actually switched a couple of things because she had put, like, Straight, same like tempo. two or three straight eight note things together and right. when we, you know, we switched a couple of things from out. And it was the same stuff we've been doing, as you said, we didn't rehearse anything especially for this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Eva was pretty strong about keeping a good balance of, um, of light uh, folk and, and, and slow ballad stuff in there. So there, we, we really didn't have much breakout opportunity. Here I am, desperately trying to ignore the tackiness of my guitar strap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this always, this always, uh, people paid attention to this part of the song. It's definitely in Keith's wheelhouse, too. I, mean, I hate to say it, but I mean, we, we just sometimes didn't seem to connect with people. And I, I think it was because we were just not going for the throat. We played at a place called the Rod and Reel Club. We sat up and we played and we actually emptied the room. Uh, people started leaving and they paid us to go home early. Eva was happy about it <laughs> because she got to go home early. Um, yeah. I think that really the essence of what she was about, a lot of it was nuance. And when we were playing the local bar and people came in and said, oh, there's a band in the corner, uh, there would be a few people that were going like, oh, this is so great. And uh, then everybody else would be, you know, doing what they do on Friday night, you know, having a drink, a few drinks and going, wah, wah, wah. And we would actually have people annoyed with us that we weren't, you know, pounding it out uh, in such a way as to encourage them to drink even more heavily. Over time, I think that it was a pretty strong um, Eva-oriented uh, song list, uh, doing most of the stuff that she enjoyed doing and wanted to do and felt good about doing. She picked the song too, didn't she? Yeah, she did, you're right. Yeah, yeah she did. I was shocked at that because yeah. I was thinking of all the tunes. But it worked. Yeah. It did, and the dynamics were really good with this song because it starts off really soft. And I know the reason why your much sweeter goodness knows your mind is a rose. True, she was very headstrong. Yeah, I tried many times to get her to do tunes that I loved, standards that I loved. Not having it, you know. I would just play lots of tunes for her and get nothing back, you know. Once in a while, she'd just go, okay, I'll try that, you know. 
she had a, a real firm sense of what she didn't want to do. <laughs> and uh, so when I could get a tune past her, it was like, you know, throwing a touchdown pass or something like that. But for something she really cared about, she'd throw it through the Eva filter, then it would come back at you, and you'd have to kind of figure out what she was going to do with it, you know? You just have to touch my cup. You're my sugar. It's so sweet when you stir it up. On the avenue, people look at you. And I know just why they do. You're much sweeter, goodness knows. You're my honeysuckle rose. How well would she be scatting now? I mean, you know, I know. It, it, I mean, it was just, she was just trying to get into it, you know? And, and, and she hey, had... Whoa, Lenny's playing. Yeah, yeah hey, I'm playing there. Okay, well, like, give me okay. a young Lenny Williams. Wow. I know. <laughs> Every honeybee fills with jealousy When they see your heart with me Your much sweeter goodness knows your my honeysuckle rose I think we were relaxed enough just from having the experience on the first night that everything came together okay on the second night, and that's what they made the record from. But, you know, there's always little things here and there that we listen to. I wish I had that one back. But. Those were the best tracks that we could choose from. They a couple of criteria. Uh, the band uh, doesn't make many mistakes in the songs. We, we had a few train wrecks that where the songs didn't end right. Um, Eva had a cold. She cracked on a few songs when she was trying to sing a high note. Her voice would go in and out. Um, little things like that disqualified some of the songs, I thought. I, and we, we both thought that, you know, you don't want anybody hearing that stuff. You know, in, in a live situation, people sit there, they watch something, something like that happens, it comes and goes, it's a memory, but it's not on a record that they can play a million times and say, ah, you did that. So we were kind of policing ourselves. We were trying to put our best foot forward. So those songs were the songs that sounded the best, her vo vocals were the best, and we didn't make any mistakes or made very few mistakes. And that's why those songs are on that record. He was the gatekeeper for the, for the quality of what was being released. I would kind of be like, ah, oh, it's good enough, you know, a few, it's a few bad notes, you know, compared to all the good notes. And he's like, nope, this one can't make the cut. And I think it's, it's been a good thing, you know. I think he says, I trust him on all those decisions. I think, except for Take Me to the River, I think she liked everything on the at, record. The, at, yeah. the, at the end of it. Yeah. Now this was Eva's idea, this song, which shocked me. Yeah. Because I always liked this song, but I thought it was kind of out of character for her. Well, I think, I didn't understand it for a while either yeah. until I heard the Al Green version. Yeah. You know? I think that's where... I think it was Talking Heads. That she liked? I think, yeah. one of the most heavily hyphenated singers I could really ever think of because she had influences that were in the folk world, in the gospel world, in the blues world, in, the, in jazz. And uh, am I leaving out a musical style here? <laughs> because it was so multi-directional and because she'd fully assimilated the things that she'd listened to and loved the most, she could sing all those different styles convincingly. Yeah, I think that was our strength. It was just being able to adjust to all these different styles that she was into. And we're kind of coming from different angles a little bit, <laughs> you know what I mean, musically. Oh, completely. God, what a disparate bunch. Never 
She cracked after we came out of this part. The very last time we did the room, she cracked on it. Right there. She didn't like that. Well, the story has been told. Yeah. She did have a cold. That, I think, really was the biggest problem with the record with her and me, because I really pushed to put that record on the, that song on the record, and she really, really didn't like that. And you telling me that Eva didn't want to put the record out at all because she hated everything. Well, we took the eight ads and we ran off rough mixes on cassettes because that's all we had back then was cassettes. Right. I played her about three or four of the songs. There was no reverb on the vocal, and it was the balance was just, not good. Yeah. It was just like we just need to have a reference, and she started crying, and said, "I don't want to put it out." Right. And I said, "Well, you got to put it out. We spent all this money on it. We got to we got to put it out." And she said, "Well." If we can put out golden thread at the end of the record. That's right, that was the concession yeah, that you made. Yeah. Right. But I just remember that day and I was like oh. seeing you and then leaving and thinking, yeah. oh man, that's a drag. <laughs> you know, yeah, really. That's not gonna happen. It was something that uh, I thought she couldn't be talked down from, but um, Yeah. We made a deal. <laughs> we made a deal. <laughs> She couldn't hear what the potential was. She heard a bad balance, and she didn't realize that the vocals were dry, there was no reverb on them, and everything was just out of balance. And it, it hurt her because she thought that it was going to be that way on the record. So um, I think that she tolerated the record. I think that she was happy with some of the record. I think that she was wanted to complete her solo album that she was doing in the studio. That's the thing that she had more control over and she felt better about. Yeah. It's a great record. I mean, record. She, she sounds great. Her bar is just extremely high. Can you imagine if it didn't come out? Yeah. Probably nobody would know who she is or not many people, so. Yeah. I mean, we would have had Eva's genius, you know, recorded, but Blues Alley could have easily not happened. I think it was left up to Eva wouldn't have happened. Even after we did it, she probably would have been like, nah. I, and I imagine a bunch of other people had sat her down at one time or another and, it, and said, listen, you may not realize this, but you are very, very good to a degree that you do not realize. But I'm telling you what I know is you've got it. <laughs> I never understood it either. She just never, ever seemed to think that she probably thought she was pretty good, but she thought it was probably over embellishment when people would, would say things like they would. The closest I came to thinking that she really realized that she'd made a contribution and moved people was at the tribute concert that they had very shortly before she died. And there was uh, a fairly large clo local club where they had this thing, and it was jam-packed, and there were people from all different walks of life and uh, that, uh, that were all, that all heard something in the music of Eva Cassidy that moved them. Lying in my bed, I, hear the I think when, when those, those tunes where we eventually dropped away from playing with Eva, I mean, it was just really us being sensitive to the fact that we weren't needed. And Eva was such a, a, a strong light that you have to back off from that. You can't try to compete with that. You have to just support it when it needs support, and then let's let it shine when it needs to shine. Almost left behind a suitcase of memories. Yeah, that's a real, real gift that she had of making a song, somehow drilling down on the tune to get to its essence and stripping away all the unnecessary stuff. And any phrase or melodic element that she thought could be more interesting, you know, she would just change the melody. And, and, it, and you thought, well, why didn't. Why wasn't it written that way in the first place? You just had that feeling. You said and you say 
that that song chokes me up a lot. Um, it's a beautiful song, and when it says your picture fades, you know that's pretty poignant. That uh, you know, obviously somebody's lost somebody, and um, you know whether it's a breakup or death or whatever. That that song really is, chokes me up to listen to that. Well, on the occasions when somebody does play me something that, that Eva did or that we did with Eva or something, I, I can sit down and listen to it and say, oh, yeah, yeah, that is good, and, uh, and really enjoy it now. The, but, but I don't want to get them out and, and, and listen to them all the time uh, for that, because I want them to continue to be special. What she would have done if she'd have lived would have been better than the stuff that we have now because she would have kept growing. Oh, absolutely. And she would have had more, uh, she would have more resources to do better yeah. things. Um, she would have worked with more people. And, um, and so knowing her like I did, I think the, the, the best thing we could ever do for Eva is to try to make sure that she's remembered in the best light. Night and that memory seems very distant, you know. But the music and the album, I think, has a legacy. I think it's already the most iconic album to ever come out of Blues Alley, which is an iconic club that a lot of people have played. I mean, I think history will be kinder and kinder to that record. I think it was really a magical thing. It's just been so many years. It's going to be 20 years soon, and uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's the past, that's for sure. <laughs> You're in a coat, Chris. I just noticed that. You're yeah, look at that. You got You're a coat dapper there, Chris. Nice. <laughs> Can I say, uh, I want to thank the band for being so wonderful. Yeah. Okay. And thank you again. That was the first thing you did with Eva, right? It was the first thing, yeah. and then I was just thinking the difference between that first recording we did in, uh, what year was that, 87, 88? Something like that, yeah. Probably 87. And she did a real, I mean, she sounded great, but it was a very straight read of this song, you know what I mean? It was just like, no, 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 you know? And from that to this, where she's really playing around with it, and so, yeah. I mean, I thought about that when you said, uh, Imagine what she'd be doing if she had lived, yeah. you know? Because, I mean, she made this huge, gigantic leap yeah. with this style of singing in a little short amount of time. Your kisses now are so blase. 
I swear, I could see Eva playing at a little 50-seat venue somewhere and people paying $500 and lining up out the door, and she could play there every night, and you would see famous people coming to see her to, to get, you know, to, to have a, an experience. Each memory that we share Not long after she broke, along came Nora Jones, and one of the things that I asked Bruce Lumville, do you think that because her musical choices were so eclectic, no, no one would sign her? Do you think this allowed that it open a door yeah. to the Nora Jones? The world? Is he on record as saying that I didn't want to miss another Eva Cassidy with Nora Jones? Didn't he say something like that? He just said, I made a terrible mistake. And he said, you're sitting in the chair where I signed Nora Jones, I signed Cassandra Wilson, and, and I could have signed Eva. And he said, I just, he said, I don't know why, I just let well, someone go by. I think it's just a different time and place. I mean, music was, was really marketed you know, really targeted for certain yeah, yeah. styles. And, and if you didn't fit into that groove, they just felt like they couldn't market you. I do think that the eclectic thing would have stayed. I don't think anyone ever would have forced Eva into a one-dimensional style. I could see lots of different people playing music with her and approaching her and wanting to do stuff. And I think she'd be bored if she was doing all the same thing. I was always slightly surprised that all that talent didn't come out in composition more often. Um, I think it might have, ultimately. And that would have been fascinating, because where would she have gone with that? I don't know. Each memory that we Most of the time she was developing her work was in the cracks, you know. She had a full-time job and friends and family. So, you know, that's, that's pretty incredible in and of itself. She wasn't even a full-time musician uh, for very much of her life. So imagine if she was, had the ability to come in and do music every day and work on things and listen to new things and have those influences. I mean, she really had the genius, so, yeah. Two years, three years, four years, she might have come up with some really cool stuff. Eventually, someone would have, have opened up and, and realized this is too good to pass up. And I'm quite sure we would be, you know, touring the world, uh, supporting. Uh, an amazing singer. It's all over now. You've changed. Yes, it's all over now. I can't deny, I don't know about the other guys, I, I can't deny a certain rare time. It's just a a, a real sense of loss that, wow, we couldn't see that one out. We couldn't ride that one out, you know. Celebi.